Uh, one of the first things that struck me was about the mortality of human existence. And that led me to thinking about how other species too must deal with mortality. And, you know, eventually you realize that the mayfly, which is a small insect, you know, a, uh, it has no stomach. It is born for one day. Its lifespan is about 24 hours. And the only purpose for its emergence in nature is to procreate. Welcome to the Literary Lounge, where we have honest conversations with authors about life, literature, and the spaces in between. I recently had the pleasure of reading this beautiful book called Where Mayflies Live Forever. And today I'm thrilled to welcome its author, Anupama Mohan, to our show. Anupama Mohan is a multifaceted literary figure, celebrated as a poet, novelist, and an esteemed professor of English and a research scholar. She has spent the deeply moving collection 20 Odd Love Poems and the poignant novel Where Mayflies Live Forever. Her work, including a variety of short stories and poems, has been featured in prestigious publications like The Wire, Himal South Asian, and Postcolonial Text. I have read her novel in a span of one day, and I can assure you that this uh, conversation is going to be as interesting as the novel itself. So first of all, thank you so much, Anupama, for joining us for this discussion. I'm super thrilled and excited to talk to you about this beautiful novel, Where Mayflies Live Forever. It was gut-wrenching and uh, so heartwarming to read your beautiful book. And I've been scarred for, I don't know, many, many days to come in the future. Uh, but before we dive into that, let me uh, let me ask, how are you doing and what have you been reading these days? Hi, Alina. Thank you for having me here. And uh, really happy that you've read the novel and you feel so strongly about it. And this is a dream come true for a writer to get to see and you know see the happiness and excitement in the face of a reader so thank you very much for that really lovely reaction and um, uh, what have i been reading i've been reading a lot of research stuff uh, but for pleasure i recently finished reading salman rushdie's knife <laughs> and it's a terrifying read you know it's the it's a it's the story of how rushdie uh, survived the knife attack on him it's a terrifying read, but it also has the familiar Rushdi personality shining through the book. <laughs> I have that book with me. I haven't started it yet, but I got that book. Yep. Yeah, it's a great cover. Uh, so, uh, super soon I'm going to pick it up because so this is going to be my first Salman Rushdi novel. I haven't read his work before. But and it's not I'm a novel. Sure. This is a mem it's not a novel. Yeah. It's, uh, a, it's, it's, it's a non-fiction non -fiction. work of what yeah. happened with him. Yeah. 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 But I'm super excited to dive into it super soon. I've heard such good things about this novel, how deeply uh, moving this book is. And yeah, hoping to pick it up soon. So uh, let's let's move on to uh, the discussion of the day where Mayflies live forever. I am super excited to get some answers about the book and learn more about it from you. Um, and I'd like to start with a very basic question, which I'm sure you would have answered a lot of times to a lot of people around you. Where did the idea of writing about a sensitive topic like rape uh, first emerged and what made you write a book about it? Yeah, when it started out, you know, I didn't think I wanted to write about, uh, you know, uh, rape as such. But uh, I wanted to write about an, e an event that would really push the human body and the human mind to its limits, you know. Uh, like the loss of one's vision, for instance, you know, or losing a limb or losing a very dear person, you know, uh, some kind of limit event that really tested uh, what it means to be human, you know, and how we define ourselves uh, in relationships to other people. So I wanted something like that, something from where, you know, the return is really hard and difficult. And as it so happened, it turned out to be uh, this event of uh, deep assault. And as you can, if, you know, as you know, uh, the rape itself is a very small part of what, uh, you know, Vinny undergoes. Um, it's the physical assault and the humiliation and the de depredation of that that really, I hope, stays with the reader. I mean, the sexual violation itself is pretty uh, traumatizing. But on top of that, is the intense feral attack 
um, you know, and uh, there is something about that. I mean, and at that time, it could have been a woman or it could have been a man, you know, in my mind. Uh, it wasn't, the gender was not very clear. When I first started writing the book, uh, I started with one single image, which is of a person running out of their home because uh, of, the, of a noise in their head. That was the first image I had. And they were running into uh, a wood, a forested area. Uh, and at the end of which was a, a, a ravine or a cliff, you know, and at the edge of the cliff, that person has to decide whether to turn back or move forward into the cliff, you know. So to me, that powerful image of a person running from the sanctuary of their own home uh, into, into a forested area, forced to choose between life and death, and where the choice lies solely with oneself, and how healthy and sound one feels in one's own mind, you know. So it's a it's a choice that one has to make. It's a very powerful moment of decision making. You either say yes to life or you say no to life. It is with that that the first uh, you know the first promulgating impulse of the book, you know, as it were, the first impulse of the book started really. Uh, and when the novel began, I only you know I only had this sliver of an image in my mind and I had called the manuscript A Quiet Place. It still is saved on my computer under the file A Quiet Place and not Mayflies. That title came up much later. Um, but then I had a talk with my publisher and I don't know if you have seen, there are two sci-fi films called A Quiet Place, part one and part two, and they're quite lovely um, with Krasinski and Emily Blunt. Um, and we thought that that seen. might, yeah. uh, we thought that might just give the readers the idea that this is another sci-fi book. So a quiet place went away, but that would have been more the kind of title that I would have gone for, you know. So that's uh, in a nutshell the genesis of the book. Got it. That that makes a lot of sense. And now that you've shared the first image that you had in your mind, I mean, I can relate with it a lot more. Mm. Re relate with the book a lot more because. That is exactly what happens and how Winnie mm. feels, right? She wants mm. to just run away to a far off place. Mm. Um, on, on that note, on the note of the title, where did Where Mayflies Live Forever come from? I mean, it's a very curious uh, question that I had in my mind. I mean, very different title, not related to the book. Not, I mean, not related to the theme of the book, mm. but it somehow fits very well into the whole mm. premise. So mm. where did this come from? You know, I mean, the book is really a philosophical meditation for me on what it means to be a human, you know, and we tend to think of human beings uh, largely in terms of relationships, right? Your uh, mother, your father, your children, your boyfriend, husband, girlfriend, wife. So these relationships make us who we are. In fact, our sense of self is so mediated by our sociality. We forget that, you know, we... It might be just fruitless to keep looking for an Anupama or an Alina divorced from all these relationships. It maybe doesn't exist. So, you know, that led me to think of particularly what happens to women, you know, whose whole social identity is wrapped up uh, so much in our, uh, you know, functions within society. I suppose it's the same for men too, but far more so for women, especially because it is women who can genetically and biologically carry children. And motherhood, uh, you know, puts on women a whole range of uh, duties and responsibilities. Uh, these may not be unique. Men can be very maternal as well. But the biological fact of carrying a child transforms a woman's body. So uh, one of the first things that struck me was about the mortality of human existence. And that led me to thinking about how other species too must deal with mortality. And, you know, eventually you realize that the mayfly which is a small insect, you know, a, uh, it has no stomach. It is born for one day. Its lifespan is about 24 hours. And the only purpose for its emergence in nature is to procreate. And so that just, you know, it just stood out to me, uh, you know, what, what kind of sentience or what kind of purpose, higher, lower, middle order, whatever you want to call it, would a mayfly have, you know? And yet it's a, it's a very important creature. It's an integral part of the chain of being. 
it's there in nature you know and uh, i wondered if human beings seen at a sufficient distance could be compared to mayflies you know and whether our mortality made us equally you know we come here to have fun and enjoy and eat you know eating being one of the most important pleasures but you have a mayfly and it has no stomach so it's not there to eat it's there only to procreate and it's a um, you know uh, you can look up the bbc videos on youtube about mayfly emergence it's just a gorgeous scene in nature it's like a buffet for all the other animals especially the uh, amphibians you know uh, and the snakes and lizards you know who have a feast when the mayflies emerge in millions uh, from a river so you know it just seemed to me that there was something very moving and uh, uh, purposive, even though individual mayflies may not have the kind of glory and heroism that we expect, you know, <laughs> megafauna to have and so on. Right. So, you know, there was a, I think there was an embedded analogy or metaphor there, I think, which I was really uh, attracted to. But as I said, it was not the first title of the book. But that is a very beautiful analogy. I mean, now when you think about it from the larger perspective, I can actually envision why that title came up in the first place. Mm. So mm. thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I hope that uh, your readers, whoever listens to this video, learns more about the title of the book from you. And it's amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, now when we talk about uh, rape, we often only talk about the victim and at times even the culprit or culprits in this case, uh, but we never uh, even think of diving into the mindset of the family. Uh, so what caught my attention with this book was how beautifully you've crafted different narratives, different perspectives. We hear from every member of the family on their version of the incident and what happens after that. So how challenging for, uh, was it for you uh, to shed light on their perspectives? Yeah, that's a great question, Alina. And I think that was a key challenge. That was a very important challenge because I wanted each chapter to be unique and I wanted each character's voice to be unique. And yet they're all from roughly the same town, right? So you can't make them extraordinarily different so that it remains uh, inauthentic in some senses. So I wanted them to be unique so that when, the when a reader uh, thought back on a particular character, uh, she would remember what that character said so the character had to be memorable without being uh you know inauthentic or in unbelief you know you can't you don't believe that that character belongs to that milieu so um so that was a real challenge but uh you know i had in mind the uh characters in faulkner for example or hemingway or dostoevsky um when I was thinking about, you know, um, these uh, chapters as point of view chapters. Uh, and then, you know, it was about being uh, really detailed in your imagination about how you embed that character locally. Uh, and yet, you know, I am, I am, I'm the kind of writer who likes the reader to do some work. So I don't, I didn't want everything to be so embedded that I was basically handing over the story or the world making to the reader. Instead, you know, I wanted the reader to collaborate in the world that I was making. So I would, you know, there are uh, there are some loose threads that don't really, you know, tie up tightly because I like, I personally like reading stories that leave a lot of room for the reader to enter. On the other hand, the idea of a quest requires that certain threads are picked up in interesting ways later, you know, like shards of a mirror that have been planted here and there so that you later piece them together like the full mirror and then you suddenly re recognize the reflection in it, you know. So that that was a certain kind of artistry for sure. And it is a challenge to fragment the narrative, but keep a tight control over the fragments yeah, so that, you know, it's not too much out of your control. And yet the control should be light and spontaneous and seemingly effortless but you should hide all the effort behind it, you know. So I hope that came through, you know. It, it, was, a, it was a lot of research because I'm not a Tamilian myself um, and I wanted to get um, place and uh, style right. But at the same time, I didn't want it to be so ethnographically locatable that people thought that I was actually just taking off from a particular incident, which is not true at all. This is really... In that sense, allegorical, there are so many incidents like it, but no one incident 
has inspired the novel. You know, it's an amalgamation of various things. Makes so, sense. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you were saying something. No, no, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, were you able to speak to people who have been there, uh, family members who have suffered such an incident? No. And uh, the only thing I did was to actually speak to a policeman because I wanted to understand police procedure, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, this novel was written during the high days of COVID. And I was in Kerala, which was the epicenter of COVID in India. You know, my family was yeah. completely freaked out. And I promised them that I would not go gallivanting around town doing interviews. And uh, and in Kerala, you know, at the in 2021, September to December, Kerala, you could not have you know, gone around too much. There was plenty of curfew rules. Uh, but a, a policeman a cons a, a came, to my, came to me and spoke with me for uh, a while and I asked him in detail. Uh, and you'd be surprised how much of police procedure is actually online. Huh? And if you know how to dig, uh, and a research scholar knows how to dig. So I, I knew how to dig. Um, so, you know, that was a lot of uh, research and there was a lot of research I did on the coverage by media of sensational incidents involving sexual violence, femicide, you know, uh, and uh, which I think, I mean, whether you do the research or not, maybe up to you, but a generally interested uh, person should know these things on what is happening in your country and so on. So uh, it involved a great deal of research, um, but I didn't want it to be an anthropological treatise, you know, uh, and I didn't want it to be a set of interviews, which is why the chapters are actually testimonials, right? It is um, the policewoman listening to audio tapes. And it is a rendition of those audio tapes, right? Each of the chapters. Right. So that is why the, the voices can be free flowing. So they are not the actual reports. The actual reports would be full of legalese and would be, uh, would as the policewoman says, um, uh, you know, one can't read and get anything of the crime at all. You know, you have to see through the reports. But the testimonies, audio testimonies record how the family members felt, what their reaction was. So I thought, you know, here I had a great chance to exploit the idea of the auditory. Mm. Uh, and she's listening to all of this because it's at the beginning of the 20th century, the uh, 21st century. Um, and uh, she's listening to the audio tapes. Right. So. That that makes a lot of sense. And uh, given the fact that, of course, this was written in a COVID period, of course, you couldn't have done those interviews. But despite everything, the novel comes out as if you can actually feel every character. The voice of every character is very particular, like you mentioned, that you wanted to uh, have a very different voice for every character. And that is there. I could I could feel it. The grandmother speaks in a very different tone. Her mother speaks in a very different tone. And then there's the father and their brothers. Everybody is speaking in a very different tone and still the story is coming out so beautifully. Uh, which character did you relate with the most? None. None. No, no favorite character? <laughs> no, no, no favorite. No. Which character did I relate to most? None. Uh, favorite character? None. Uh, sort of an interesting character to pull off. Uh, without losing sight of its, uh, you know, its uh, integrity uh, was, uh, you know, probably the Murali character, which I had great fun writing. He's the sidekick, you know, uh, yeah. and his venality, his, uh, uh, you know, his minor villainy contrasted with the major villainy of those whom he serves. And yet, you know, he's not quite the aggressor nor fully always the victim you know so you know to, to get that balance right was hard and yet you know I wanted him to be I to be distinctive as a sidekick but not a parody you know so though we laugh at him we are also horrified by him you know so it had to be that so that was an interesting experiment in voice and narration and I had to find the right tone I had to you know so I would I would write lines and then remove them and I would write new lines because I wanted to get in my ear and my mind uh, that tonality right. You know, I didn't want, I wanted him to be repugnant, but, um, uh, but still, you know, his sense of being a victim 
of society or of you know toxic masculinity if you will that needed to come out too but not so much that it would absolve him you know so you know as a writer i feel like my job is not to write characters that i like or dislike but that i can you know i can sufficiently let a reader like or dislike and not right. leave the reader cold one way or the other you know it's nice to have a reader to say that i dislike that character very much and then you know if you like okay that was a good job <laughs> yeah that 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 does make a lot of sense i mean if if i stro- feel very strongly towards a character this means it's hmm. very well written hmm hmm or okay it's the uh, su- success of one order i mean the uh, it would be terrible if the writer made wanted to make you like the character and you ended up disliking it that, that that's not what we are going for yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense too. <laughs> <laughs> that would go against uh, the nature of the book but um okay moving on to another character i would like to like dive into a few characters now one would sure. one was uh, that was very interesting was winnie's father and you could feel his um i don't know his sense of hopelessness uh, mm-hmm. that there is nothing he could do about mm-hmm. the whole incident and his daughter suffered so much and he still is not able to do anything about it and there's a line that stuck with me and it says a father remembers everything and tucks it all deep into his chest that is his curse and this made me feel and realize that aren't all men around us like this that they are the first ones to move on they want to move on so that everybody else in the family can move on along with them so uh, what was your thought process when writing about this particular character and how did you think yeah you know uh because like there are a few men in it and men are the perpetrators of the violence as well right so it was very uh, important for me to not uh tar all the men with the same brush you know um that would be a reduction of the actual situation firstly and it would also not be right because there are plenty of uh male members of society who are equally outraged by so- social and sexual violence and we tend to think that uh, gender issues impact only women but actually a lot of men are uh, victims of sexual violence as well you know so e- the male characters from in my mind needed to be diverse you know they needed to be distinctive and uh, even where even where they stay true to type that a reader would anticipate and ex- expect uh i wanted to do interesting things that the reader did not expect you know so uh writing the father was very interesting because veni learns a great deal from her father you know and tamil nadu has one of the worst statistics in the country for uh uh feticide female feticide uh and female infanticide uh and i often wonder about the kind of social burden placed on parents to have a male child and that is true for all of india in some ways um so i wondered how he would feel you know with the daughter and you know a lot of it was just imagining a a progressive man who has not undergone a kind of metropolitan training but who's you know whose idea of progressivism is one that he has come to on account of his own life and experience and you know tamil culture is uh, is is ancient and tremendously uh, you know uh, tremendously inspiring uh with a n- unbroken record of written culture for 2500 years is one of the most ancient languages in the world you know and uh, tamil people have a very powerful sense of uh, literary and cultural tradition and uh, you know many of my tamil friends and their family members routinely speak in poetry and prose together and many of them uh, remember and recall with delight sangam poems um so you know all of that weaves into the texture of one's own local forms of cosmopolitanism this is not the cosmopolitanism of you know someone you bump into at the airport you know seven times a year uh so that's a kind of metropolitan cosmopolitanism and we tend to think that all cosmopolitanism is like that and we forget that in fact many you know the openness of mind the ability to learn from uh one zone culture and different cultures these are often the should be or at least in my mind the hallmark of a cosmopolitan mind you know um so i wanted the father to come across as a figure like that and yet you know how helpless he is in the face of such violence in the face of this kind of really overwhelming social injustice mm. uh 
you know, so I wanted him to be a moving character, to be honest, you know, uh, but caught in the grip of something way more than uh, an individual can correct. So I hope I captured some of that, uh, you know, existential kind of anguish of the father himself. And this is the further anguish that he cannot partake of the pain of his daughter. So that too, you know, really uh, breaks him. Mm. Definitely, I, I think. Uh... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, and I didn't want the father to be, you know, like a punching bag, you know, uh, for blame. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had him punch himself. Right. Yeah. That actually comes very clearly in the book. And there's this one section where he also says something like, I have it highlighted. Um, what if instead of teaching uh, Winnie about mayflies, I would have taught her about how to defend herself? And then if something like this happens, even after that, how should she move on? And that is one part that stuck with me a lot. I mean, I was like, I think all fathers who have daughters in their homes mm -hmm. think about it on some level yeah. at some point in their lives, whether yeah. it be after marriage or before that or because of some incident. But this thought, I think, uh, strikes every uh, father once in a while. Because Definitely. Definitely. And I'm a, I'm a child of Delhi. I have seen my parents go into panic when they don't see me at 6 p.m. back at home. And it's only 6 p.m., you know. Yeah. So uh, you're absolutely right. Huh? There are fathers who have this sort of uh, constant, you know, worry about their daughters. And, you know, it, we, we feel like it is so natural when you go and live in a different country and you realize how free the women are and you suddenly you know realize that one of the major burdens of being a parent is this constant sense of you know fear about your child's security that is just insane in a place like india you know in different cities in india if you're a if you're the father or the mother of a daughter absolutely absolutely that that makes a lot of sense and we see a very stark contrast between Winnie's father and Winnie's husband I, and the best part about this book was that there were so many men and everybody was in a very different light and you mm. get to see a very different perspective from every particular man um mm. Winnie's husband is one very peculiar character that I found because he never properly he speaks as if he never properly knew her or maybe mm. he wants to portray her like that in front of the uh, police uh, officer mm. uh, and never wants to we see him speak like he was probably guilty or what if he could have protective protected Winnie uh, he never talks about her in a hopeless manner. He just, I don't know, he's just bland, I would say. Uh, what what was your thought process when writing about his character? Yeah, you know, again, uh, you know, I wondered about the kind of men, you know, who who are the partners of women that have undergone extreme sexual violence. And, uh, you know, I wanted to, re to remain sympathetic and sub at some level. But on the other hand, I think uh, I'm not sure if this one man can be held as symbolic of all men, firstly. And I wanted, that is why I said I wanted each character to be unique. Uh, he's, he's a little bit of an oddball, I agree. I'm not sure <laughs> um, where I was fully going with him. But I think I wanted an oddball-like character, you know. And I like the fact that as a reader, you are saying maybe he was like that or maybe he was like that, which I think is the right way to think of characters. And that, you know, we sh in my mind as a writer, I don't want each character to be fully mappable onto a real-life human being, you know. Otherwise, literature's beauty goes away. Literature's beauty is this kind of endless speculation that you can make and you can't really resolve one way or the other because the drama of psychology lies in, you know, a person's uh, motivations not being fully transparent, you know. So I like that you are thinking he's maybe a bit like that. So he's an oddball in that sense. And he's an oddball to the family members too. He doesn't seem to behave in that way. And yet, you know, I hope there are passages of beauty, you know, when he really loved his wife. He, he loved sleeping with her, you know, they enjoyed their love making. Uh, but, you know, he always, you know, maybe maybe it is the burden of traditional values and traditional expectations that some men don't really understand what their women are like and what they want. Um, so it could be one of those things too. And, uh, you know, I, I hoped I still humanized him. 
uh, and uh, you know, um, and I yes, think because they I, were hmm. they were they were mixed feelings because in the beginning he says things like, um, I I don't understand why women uh, are so uptight and uh, you know uh, when when Benny used to come to bed she used to you know uh, undo all her clothes and wear loose clothes so that she could go off to sleep uh, in in a peaceful way. Uh, why do women have to, you know, keep themselves so tight, bound up with everything that they do? So there are thoughts like that. And then there are thoughts like, I don't know if I uh, probably understood her that well, because sometimes she would just be lost in things that she would do and I wouldn't understand her. Mm. So we see a mix of both kind of emotions. It's not just mm-hmm. one perspective. There, there are multiple yeah. perspectives from him. Yeah. And I think, I think uh, you know, some of us have friends who are men who have grown up in gender segregated schools. And uh, some of us ourselves have grown up in gender segregated schools. And, you know, it leads to a kind of uh, real, uh, you know, gap between a man and a woman. And, you know, how fundamentally hard it is for such people to figure out the, the what is common in the dreams and desires between men and women, you know. And I'm personally, a, I do not at all uh, recommend sending your child to a boys only or girls only school. I think in those 12 years, it's very important for your child to mix with all genders, all sexualities, all orientations. And it's too late by the time you come to college because you know that it's sort of, it's just uh, hardwired into you to look at another human being through those, you know, uh, gender-based lenses rather than right. personality or common interests. Yeah. So yeah, he could he could be he could be one of those many men, you know, who uh, who grew up without women for a significant period of time. You know. So again, that yeah. could be maybe those are the big parts of. <laughs> of course, that definitely is always there, and I loved how uh, you know we are left with an open ended thing in the book that I will come to uh, very soon. I think that's the next question. Yes. <laughs> so um, the book ends on an open note. Uh, we don't know what happens to Vinny. We don't know where she goes in the end. But, uh, and there, these are a few questions that I have. First, what happened to Vinny? How did she manage her life after everything happened? What happened to the other culprits after Adivan gets murdered? What happens to the two brothers, her parents and her grandmother? Do they move on from this hoping against hope that Vinny is safe from all harm? Or do they consider her dead, wondering if she committed suicide? Do you have any answers for any of these for me or for our readers? From your perspective, even if a few answer, questions get answered, I would be thrilled. It's like, you know, when we finish watching a film, we're like, ex- ending explained. Exactly. I do that a lot, you know. I, I always go, go to these uh, Google sites or Reddit even to check for ending explained. Uh, sometimes I don't understand. Sci-fi movies especially. Yeah, yeah. No, and you know, I think that uh, you know that is something I wanted to uh, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, not not answer to you know the need to find a a perfectly harmonious ending. Um, and you can see that the last chapter, so the in between chapters, between the point of view chapters, are of course omniscient narrator right a third person voice you know channeling Vaini's thoughts with not Vaini herself speaking but you know like a your traditional storytelling style where somebody third person is telling us the truth she sees a sunlight or she sees uh, trees and so on and so forth uh, and uh, you know the novel ends where the novel starts you know so the novel ends the evening before the murder and Vaini decides mm. that she has you know whatever her decision is so, you yeah. know, I wanted there to be that kind of cyclic, cyclical quality. But at the same time, you know, uh, what Vini is going to do is Vini's decision, you know. And uh, there, you know, one of the nice things that I heard from one of the readers is that uh, she never thought that the grotto or the cave is a real place, uh, but that she thought that it was a, the cave of the mind, as in Plato, you know, in Plato's allegory of the cave. And I thought, you know, for a reader that that if that works and that so be it but i spent a lot of time researching grottos and caves and i actually wanted sitana vasal's cave complex to be real uh and uh, you know and i wanted the restorative powers of nature to be a part of vaini's journey towards understanding who she was after the um traumatic traumatic event you know 
so uh so you know the ending is as much about human and personal thinking and desire you know to transcend pain to transcend the humiliation and degradation one feels but it also sort of zooms out and tries to see the human as a very small part of a larger you know ecology you know and i i wondered personally you know uh, when i have been very angry i try to see things from the perspective of other people and suddenly you know my anger sort of pales and i wonder if this is this is very bad self psychology you know because sometimes you want your anger to be there so that you take a decision you say that no we have to do it this way but uh, you know but it is true if you if you you know zoom out of the individual what do you get you get the social uh, maybe you get the community then you get the national and you get the social and then you know how depends on how many levels you zoom until you zoom far enough and you're just a blue planet you know uh right. in that wonderful imagery of the blue planet that earth is so you know again so i was playing with these dimensions and the idea of the mayflies comes back over and over in that sense right uh but it doesn't it doesn't mean that my my desires or my worries and my anguish has no meaning it has a lot of meaning ha huh. and i must find the answers that i seek and i must be happy with the answers i i get or find or make and with the questions that remain you know so something of that is there at the ending of the novel you know i think you know uh, it's not a pat clean harmonious ending and uh, i you know if that is disappointing to some readers then that's a fact of the novel but uh, <laughs> it is a novel about uh, perhaps also how we read and what we expect right. our stories to do to us hmm. makes sense and beautiful how vinny finds herself in the end uh mm. because that is what the reader hopes for you know mm. whenever you read something about it you always hope for a happy ending which mm. of course in the practical world is, does not exist but mm. even then you hope that there has to be some kind of revenge or she should be able to avenge her culprits or or something of that sort should happen a happy ending for vinny and that is there in in some ways but i love the mm. ending even though it was open ended i could uh, you know weave my own answers uh, in the end hoping that this would probably it uh, probably be it but that was a very beautiful ending i would say i mean if readers are not accepting it i don't know but i like i like such books so i did love it and i think i would like to move on to the last question uh, of this interview and uh, I've loved talking to you Anupama this was a very very uh, heartwarming discussion but before I let you go and before I wrap up this discussion I would love a few book recommendations from you uh, especially because you're also an English professor so I'm sure we are going to get some very interesting titles that I'll be happy to add to my TBR so okay. what books would you recommend okay uh, I can I can recommend a couple of books that went into the making of this one and maybe mm-hmm. that will help you see uh, you know where i was coming from and uh, you know in terms of technique if you can see uh, any of the interesting stuff that i borrowed you know, and stole <laughs> from other writers um, there is uh, fernanda melchor's beautiful novel very difficult to read novel but absolutely mandatory reading novel called uh, hurricane season you know uh i believe netflix has made some kind of uh uh you know film or uh, s- series over it but i haven't watched that uh so hurricane season uh is a, is a book i would recommend it's a very hard book to read and i think also technically uh a very difficult book to read um and that was definitely uh you know at at the back of my mind you know that heavy sense of doom in a society which is so used to sexual violence that it has become normalized you know uh, and she's uh, uh she's a journalist by training so her whole approach was very different to mine you know um the other novel that i would recommend if you haven't read it already is crime and punishment by dostoevsky okay it's Have probably it, yes. the best novel in the whole world forever and forever <laughs> 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 yeah and uh, it's a it's a you know it's a primer for novelists on how to write i mean dostoevsky haters will hate it but i suppose yeah, all novelists must uh, 
read Russian novelists to, you know, basically uh, get get their lessons. Whether you depart from those lessons or you continue those lessons is up to individual mm-hmm. writers. But uh, Crime and Punishment is a, is a brilliant read. And, uh, you know, I go back to it every few years. Um, and each time something new grabs me, you know. Um, and it's a very specific kind of novel. It's not a perfect novel. It doesn't cover everything that you expect. But it's, uh, it's so much about human psychology and about uh, social reality. You know that you can't imagine that one one novel can ace both at the same time. So I would today, pick those it up are now. my two recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> I will pick it, pick those up now. I, I'm not sure about hurricane season because you already mentioned it's a very difficult read. So I like to steer clear from difficult reads because that hinders my reading process, and then I end up not reading anything for days. So I will try, but crime and punishment for sure. I'm going to pick it up. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much Anupama this was this was lovely uh thank you for being here today for having this heartfelt discussion about your book where mayflies live forever I hope this discussion urges people to pick your book up and uh, dive into the story of Vinny and her family and thank you fellow readers for tuning into this conversation if you haven't read where mayflies live forever yet Go get it in a bookstore near you or order it on Amazon. I will drop in the link in the description below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Melody Unix and follow us on Instagram. If you like this discussion, give us a big fat thumbs up and I'll see you in the next episode.